Raquel comes up here, I'll give an intro. So Dr. Raquel Rodriguez Perez is principal scientist at Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research, also known as NIBR, in the PK Modeling and Simulation Data Sciences team since 2020. Raquel obtained her bachelor's and master's degrees in biomedical engineering from the University of Barcelona and her PhD in computational life sciences from the University of Bonn. She was a Marie Sklodowska Curie Fellow and a member of the Computational Chemistry Data Science Team at Beringer Ingelheim in Germany. Her research has focused on predictive modeling and pattern recognition in chemistry and life sciences, including prediction of compound properties and the application of data science tools to support decision making and drug discovery. And with that, I will turn it over to Raquel. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today, thanks to the organizing committee. Um, today I will have the opportunity to explain you uh, some of the work that we do at Novartis related to AI-driven drug design, and in particular, I'm in the pharmacokinetics department, and I would like to explain you how we include PK and admin formation into all these uh, machine learning new workflows that are changing the way that we are doing drug design. AI systems are currently used for drug discovery and lead optimization efforts. And actually, machine learning models have permeated almost every step of the design, make, test, and analyze cycle, the DMTA cycle. For instance, the design of the molecules can already be done through generative modeling, as we have seen in previous talks. And we can score either these AI-based designs or human-based designs with uh, property prediction models, which are based on machine learning. Once we have some compounds that we want to synthesize, we also have machine learning models that can help us how to plan the synthesis, and we've also so, uh, seen some examples today. And once we have the compound and we create uh, new experiments and new data points, then we can feed this data back to the model, improve our predictions, and have a better loop. Actually, we can also generate data directly to improve machine learning models, which will be the active learning loop. And then we can uh, maybe not benefit from this data directly into drug discovery projects, but we can improve our machine learning models to have better decisions in the future. The topic that I will mainly talk about today is how to better predict and how to incorporate predictions of ADME and PK in this process. And why is this important? Pharmacokinetics studies the variation of the concentration over time of the drug or compound in different compartments of the body. Mainly we study it in plasma, but you might also be interested in the concentration time profile in the brain. And actually, some years ago, um, people were focusing a lot on activity. You want to have good potency against your target. And then we were observing later stage compound attrition. So the early and early consideration of the PK and ADME properties, it's giving us more chances to further progress with those compounds. But we can only do in vivo studies with very uh, late stage compounds. So we have some proxies and some measurements in vitro that are giving us some idea of the absorption, the distribution, the metabolism, and excretion of the, of the compound. And currently, with machine learning, we also have another pillar here, which is the prediction of these in vitro assay results and the in vivo PK studies, even before the th synthesis of the compound. So we can really have an enrichment of compounds with favorable PK properties. Which kind of machine learning are we, are we talking about here? Because we have seen very different applications today. So I'm mainly talking about machine learning models that relate the structure of the compound with the ADME or PK property. These are called quantitative or qualitative structure property relationship models. So the first step will be encoding the molecule numerically. And as we've seen also today, there are many different ways some of them are more classical, are fixed representations, maybe fingerprints, 
but we also have CDDD or we also have um, Melody Embeddings, which um, is um, a model that came from a federated learning consortium of 10 pharma partners. So we can use learned representations and embeddings from deep learning models, but we can also use the classical descriptors or fingerprints. Once we have a molecular representation, we can use this as input to our machine learning algorithm that can be trained to predict different properties. I will give you an example, and this is the example of metabolic clearance. This is quite important property in PK. Clearance is the main, um, so hepatic clearance is the main elimination uh, of the compounds from the body, and we have in vitro systems to know if the compound will be metabolically cleared very quickly. And this is um, very important, it's very important information for compound optimization and compound selection. So one of the models that we have at Novartis is leveraging information from multiple species in a so-called multi-species metabolic, metabolic clearance model. So for some of the species, as you may see here, uh, we have a lot of data. So we have rat with a lot of data, but for some higher uh, species such as monkey, we have lower data and also for dog. So what we did is to build a model using all these species, uh, using uh, multitask learning. In, a, in this case, we use graph neural network for representation learning. And what we observe is a consistent better performance, and especially for cases uh, with these lower data, scenarios, we observe an improvement. So you can see the comparison of a single task or single species, XGBoost or a graph neural network compared in green and red to a multitask or multi-species graph neural network and an ensemble variant of this same algorithm. But are these models useful? Is, are these fault errors good enough to drive decisions? We have to put in context with the essay and experimental variability and see if we are having models of enough quality to drive decisions. Since uh, optimizing a compound, it's a multi-parameter op optimization or um, yeah, objective function, we want to facilitate the decisions uh, for our chemists and we do a lot of times a thriving system with essays discussed with experts. And in this case, for instance, we have a low risk bin, a high risk bin, and a medium uh, bin. This also to consider experimental variability. So basically, you can see a lot of properties, either measured or in silico, and you can see whether you are in a low risk bin or a high risk bin and have an idea of your ADME profile. If we have multiple experiments for the same compound, how reproducible are these categories? So this is what we quantified. Imagine that you, you have three experiments for the same compound. Maybe these experiments were not run in the same laboratory, were not run the same month, were not run by the same people. So we want to know how to expect from the model. And for that, we quantified first experimental variability. In the first row, you observe the reproducibility of the low cleaned category for rat, human, and mouse. So in dark um, green, we observe between 81 and 87% of reproducibility. This means that if you have a low cleaned result, you repeat the experiment again, it's very likely that you get the same result, but it's not 100%. And what is more interesting is that for the high clearance compounds, the reproducibility is much lower. So when uh, we repeat the experiment, we have around 8% of chances that now we have a high cleaned, a low cleaned, sorry, uh, measurement. So if I now show you the results of the machine learning model, you probably interpret it in a different way. Because here we observe the model precision is matching the experimental reproducibility. But if I would have started with a model precision of 75%, maybe you would have said that I will need to try more algorithms, maybe other molecular representations, but actually it's the same precision and sometimes even slightly higher than experimental reproducibility. So it's important to put in context the experimental reproducibility with the performance of the model. And now we can see that we can use these models actually for decision making. And something important is that here we have the limitation that between 25 and 30% of our predictions were set to inconclusive. 
So we identified that the model was uncertain about these predictions. We are not reporting them to the user, but when the user sees a prediction from the model, uh, it's very likely that it's true or it's equivalent to the experiment. What data do we use for these models? In pharmaceutical industry, we have large amount of data. Shall we use all the data to build the model or shall we build models for a specific projects or for a specific series? Because maybe if we build a global model considering all disease areas or chemical space, we are biasing the model. It's not as representative of our chemical space of interest. So there are some perceived advantages and disadvantages. One of them is uh, the one that I just mentioned, maybe a local model for a project or for a series is more representative. On the other hand, it's more work. We have to build local models for every project, for every series, and maybe we are overfitting due to the small uh, data scenarios. On the other hand, if we build a global model, we expect the model to have more generalization capabilities, but maybe we are introducing some noise or some bias and it's not so representative of our series. So what shall we do? We did a retrospective analysis with more than 100 projects at Novartis and 10 ADME essays, which are listed here in the X-axis. So we have things like bile salt export pump inhibition, BCEP, um, so this is more on the um, predictive safety, or we have MDR1 transporter, important also for brain penetration, uh, log P and log D, solubility, passive permeability using two different assays, HERC, and also metabolic clearance with rat and, and human. We see a consistent trend towards relative performance values going towards uh, positive values. This means that the global models were performing better for the projects. It's dot here, it's a project. So we consistently see that if we build global models and local models with the same split of data, we are having superior performance with global models, between 3 and 25% improvement on average, and only 7% of the projects benefiting from a local solution. But what about transfer learning? Most of the times we've observed transfer learning applied to new tasks. There are a lot of applications now about few shot learning where you have a low data scenarios mainly for activity predictions. You have a new activity essay for a project and then you want to still use uh, activity data across uh, projects. And then you can, uh, you can use few shot learning and transfer learn to a new task. But what about a new domain? Because this is what we are um, we are facing with ADME predictions. We have the same essays used across projects. We have a lot of data, but maybe we could transfer, learn, and adapt the model to the specific chemical space of a project or a series. So that's what we've been exploring. Uh, we are trying to adapt machine learning models for a specific uh, chemical space. And we have tested different transfer learning approaches to try to combine the benefits of global models, which are superior than local models, but they're still trying to leverage the project-specific information. We tested different approaches. Here I've, I've highlighted two of them, uh, which are related to fine-tuning. The first one is based on having the global model weights as initialization and then fine-tuning with project-specific data, uh, which is shown in orange. And then we have the freezing approach where the message passing in a network part is frozen and then we fine tune the rest and this shown, is shown in green. And again, we also report the local models in purple to see a comparison. Each dot, it's again a, a project and this is for rat metabolic clearance. Relative performance of the models compared to global models are shifted towards positive values for local, indicating again that local models are not suitable for ADME property prediction. But we've seen a benefit of transfer learning. So we could refine uh, specific global models for uh, projects, and this brings many opportunities. First, maybe reusing models from, uh, from the public domain in pharma companies, fine tuning with internal data, or also 
uh, doing um, er, uh, quicker active learning loops because we don't need to retrain the full model, but we can fine tune with small amounts of data because we've seen that this is um, also working with small numbers of data for fine tuning. Can we also predict in vivo endpoints? Because so far I focus more on the in vitro ATME. Can we also predict in vivo PK endpoints? Brain penetration is a very important property because for CNS projects you want to achieve brain penetration, but many other projects might observe adverse events if you have an off target in the brain. And one of the mechanisms to prevent these adverse events is not entering to the brain. Um, however, the data in, in the public domain comes from very different protocols. It's not very well harmonized. It's very challenging to find a public data set. And also internally, it's not as big as in other endpoints, of course, because it's relying on in vivo. On the other hand, the data sets are very imbalanced. Um, it will be both in the public domain and internally, 85% of the compounds will be penetrating to the brain. So we will need to achieve good performance on both categories. What we did was to leverage large amounts of in vitro data to predict an in vivo endpoint. If we were building models only considering in vivo data, the performance was not good enough, it was not good enough to use for decision making. But what we did is to um, check which mechanisms are involved in brain penetration and for which ones we have in vitro data. For instance, passive permeability, or the flux of the compound out of the brain by the MDR1 or PGP transporter. So leveraging these large amounts of in vitro data gave us a good model that is currently being used internally, both uh, to prioritize, for instance, library enumeration, uh, compounds prior to synthesis, but also to prioritize in vivo brain uh, studies. How, does, how um, do these results compare to more traditional approaches? There are CNS scores, some multi-parameter optimization scores that are based on uh, calculated properties. Some of them have been published uh, in national chemistry um, journals, and we wanted to compare. These are more intuitive for medicinal chemists, so this brings also an advantage for them. It's not like trusting a black box. Therefore, we compared and we observed that the precision of these uh, different strategies was quite high for um, the detection of brain penetrant compounds, the so-called BBB+. But if we check and how many times um, the model predicted that a compound was not entering the brain, and was not entering into the brain, this is very low a percentage. So actually, if we look at Matthew correlation coefficient, which is considering all the confusion matrix, then we see that the values are not so promising anymore. Standard machine learning models, here I just put K KNN and random forest with two descriptors, but we tested different options, have the same problem. And only with this multitask learning approach, and especially with the addition of inconclusives, um, approximately 30% of inconclusive, we were able to achieve very good performance. These models are integrated in target property profiles and used, for instance, for genetic chemistry efforts. Uh, something that we have observed is that the novel design 2.0 has different changes, and two of the most important ones are the algorithms, ML and AI, and the second one is the integration of ADME and PK and more and more also toxicology. So uh, we have a collaboration with Microsoft Research where we are uh, joining forces to custom customize GenChem, not only testing different um, basic research questions and trying algorithms and developing new science, but also creating a platform for genetic chemistry that can be used uh, by the projects that it's integrated in our data analysis tools and we have a feedback loop from the projects to further improve our uh, GenChem efforts and models. So to conclude, I would like uh, to highlight the fact that machine learning models are now present in drug design and all the DMTA cycle. I hope I convince you uh, about the importance of these machine learning models even prior to synthesis because we can enrich a favorable chemical space in terms of PK and ATME. <laughs> But once the company is made, we can also prioritize in vivo testing and try to reduce some in vivo PK studies. 
And finally, the combination of experimental data and machine learning predictions to drive decisions is something uh, that is currently very important and for that we need to understand the uncertainties both in our experimental data and in our predictions. I would like to conclude by thanking all the collaborators in the Microsoft Research Collaboration with Novartis and also the ones who helped in the PK and ADME predictions. Thanks. Thanks, Erica. Um, we have time for some questions. Uh, please come up to the microphone. Thank you for your wonderful talk. So, how about uh, incorporating causal inference into MTGN for property prediction? If I have integrated causal inference? Causal inference, yeah. No, we have not. Yeah, <laughs> it's possible to use this methodology and algorithm to enhance the QSAR prediction. I don't have experience with this topic, but I will be delighted to chat uh, about causal inference and how to include it in, in GNNs. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. So I just wanted to briefly ask, so you mentioned the MTGNN and how you're adding in like about 100 times more data, but it, it's of a different, like it's a different type of data point, and it's a different, essentially different um, like a point that you're predicting. You're not predicting the same property. And so it, if it's multitask and it's like outputting, you know, your multi-class labels, how, are you are you just masking out the things that are that you're not predicting that they don't that where the data is missing because if you go from two thousand to two hundred thousand, like not everything is labeled in every category, right? Yes, uh, we are using a mask loss function for that. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is a question on the Zoom. Uh, what do you mean by MCF seven biological space? Could you repeat? Sorry. Um, what do you mean by MCF7 biological space? Maybe is the question kind of make sense or? Uh, MCF7. 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 I, uh, I don't think I've mentioned the as okay, the maybe it's, line. No, <laughs> no okay. <laughs> Never mind. Maybe it was from another talk. I don't know. <laughs> Doesn't sound familiar. Thank you, Raquel, for the, for the nice talk. Um, my question here is related to when you're talking about uh, using the multitask models, for instance, and seeing better performance. Um, have you also kind of looked into uh, generalization? I guess what you were showing was between different species, for example, right, the, the clearance properties. But what about when you're thinking about generalization across different therapeutic modalities? Um, do you see the same kind of performance when you include um, kind of data across therapeutic modalities, does it also generalize better there? Or is that where local models tend to kind of outperform the global ones? Yeah, uh, to this we've observed uh, on per project basis. So we've done time split and random split for a specific projects and for a specific series. And we have observed the same trends. Either you look at specific series or project. Um, we've also observed a good performance of global models um, across different therapeutic areas. Uh, I think they have more generalization ability. That's what we've observed with our benchmarks. And local models, um, I mean, we both for global models and local models, we observe better performance on a random split that time split. Uh, the one, one difficulty of uh, conveying this message is that when local models are built, you normally don't have so many data points, so you always evaluate on random split, while global models you always evaluate on time split. So sometimes there is a mismatch, uh, but if we compare global and local uh, on their generalization capability on time split, then global models are performing better. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you very much. If there's no other questions, oh, Pat, sorry. Sorry, just one more. Nice talk, Raquel. Um, so you run into cases where you've got different routes of elimination across species, right? So mice don't have aldehyde oxidase, but dogs do. So you know, this seems like it could be confounding for your model because you could have compounds that are rapidly cleared in mice, but not in dogs. And I was wondering if you took a look at cases where you had 
clearance that wasn't correlated and tried to remove that from the model and whether it made anything better. Yeah, that's a very good point. Actually, what we are looking at right now, it's in which cases do the predictions differ and if this, could, uh, this is related with the uncertainty from, of the model. So this is something that we are following up on. But overall, in general trends, uh, this approach was working better. Okay, thank yeah, you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for coming.